Good afternoon, this is Ellie Milholland. I'll be your moderator today. Um, we'll give it just a few more minutes uh, for folks to join the conference. We'll be starting in just a few more minutes. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Elliot Milholland. I'm a partner with the law firm of Hobbs, Straustein and Walker in Washington, DC. I'm filling in for my colleague, Jeff Strummer, uh, and will serve as your moderator today. Uh, welcome to the latest webinar from the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, brought to you by our friends at the Native American Concerns Committee and co-sponsored by the ABA Government and Public Sector Lawyers Division, the Commission on Homelessness and Poverty, the Center for Public Interest Law and the Coalition on Racial and Ethnic Justice. The Coalition on Racial and Ethnic Justice has a goal to rapidly respond to government action that may impact civil rights and civil liberties by offering free webinars, commentary, podcasts, social media posts, and other information from subject matter experts. The section encourage you, encourages you to set, check the section website, which is www.americanbar.org forward slash CR. SJ, its Facebook page and its Twitter handle, which is at ABA underscore CRSJ, for more news and information and replays of its programming. If you like their work, they invite you to become a member of the CRSJ section and collaborate with them on projects you want to develop and offer to members um, and to the general public. So uh, first, some housekeeping items. Um, due to the number of attendees who have signed up for today's webinar, um, uh, we have uh, placed uh, all of the attendees um, on, uh, on mute, so you will not be able to directly ask your questions to the presenters. Rather, um, you can ask questions of the panelists by finding the questions drop-down box on the right-hand side panel and typing in questions. Uh, there will be time at the end for our panelists to address all of them, and I will be um, uh, going through those questions and asking them of our panelists uh, so we can get their input on your questions. Uh, there's also a, on the panel, there is a handouts drop down where you can access uh, written material and PowerPoint presentations. We will also be sharing our recording of the program with the handouts to everyone who's registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. Please feel free to leave us feedback or ask questions to follow up. So we are thrilled, thrilled today to bring you uh, today's program, which is entitled the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Report Broken Promises, Continuing Federal Funding Shortfall for Native Americans. On December 20th, 2018, the United States Commission on Civil Rights re released its report, which revisits the commission's 2003 report, A Quiet Crisis, 
federal funding and unmet needs in Indian country, which evaluated the expenditures of federal agencies on Native American programs. The Broken Promises report is based on expert and public input, including from the National Congress of American Indians and extensive research and analysis. The report found that funding for services critical to Native Americans was disproportionately lower than that for other populations. The report also offers recommendations to the President, Congress, and numerous federal agencies on how to honor the trust obligations to tribal nations. That being said, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. We have a very distinguished uh, set of guests here who are going to share their expertise with you today. Uh, first, we have Commissioner Karen Narasaki, we have Chief Lynn Malerba, and we have Chairman Ron Allen. Commissioner Karen Narasaki is an independent civil rights and human rights consultant. President Barack Obama appointed Ms. Narasaki to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in July of 2014. She previous, previously served as president and executive director of Asians Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, one of the nation's premier civil rights organizations. Prior to that, she was the Washington representative for the Japanese American Citizens League. And before that, she was an attorney with Perkins Coie. She began her career as a law clerk for Judge Harry Perguson of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit from 1985 to 86. She received a BA from Yale College, magna cum laude, and a JD from the University of California, uh, Los Angeles School of Law, Order of the Coif. Then we have Chief Lynn Malerba. She is the Secretary for the United States, uh, for the United South and Eastern Tribes Sovereignty Protection Fund. On August 15th, 2010, she became the 18th Chief of the Mohegan Tribe and is the first female Chief in the tribe's modern history. Prior to becoming Chief, she served as Chairwoman of the Tribal Council and also worked in tribal government as Executive Director of Health and Human Services. She is a registered nurse and holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of Connecticut and an honorary doctorate from the St. Joseph College in Hartford. She is one of the 14 tribal leaders in the Justice Department's Tribal Nations Leadership Council, and she is also chairwoman of the Tribal Self-Governance Advisory Committee of the Federal Indian Health Service. Chairman Ron Allen is the chairman and the CEO of the Jamestown Sklalem Tribe. He's also the treasurer of the National Congress of American Indians. As tribal chairman, uh, uh, Ron Allen is responsible for representing the tribe as its elected leader and for addressing political and policy issues and positions at the national, state, and local levels. As the CEO, he is also responsible for the executive administration of all of the tribe's programs, including education, career development, social services, housing, and health, economic development, natural resources management, and tr cultural traditional affairs. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to um, our three panelists. Um, we will be starting with uh, Commissioner Narasaki, followed by Chief Malerba, and finally by Chairman Allen. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Commissioner Narasaki. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the ABA and the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice's Native American Concerns Committee and all the other ABA committees who are co-sponsoring today's webinar for inviting me to speak on uh, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights recently released report. Uh, for the record, I'd like to note that I'm speaking in my individual capacity and my remarks today are not necessarily the views of the Commission, except where I'm referring to findings from the Commission. I've made it a priority during my term to ensure that significant civil rights issues facing Indigenous peoples in America continue to be highlighted whenever possible. Uh, there is no Commissioner who is Native American currently. This report is the result of several years of work by staff, our state advisory committees and commissioners, as well as many agencies, tribal leaders, and organizations that submitted extensive testimony and information. As an independent and bipartisan federal agency, the commission has the unique responsibility to report annually on federal civil rights enforcement, to consider and make recommendations to the administration and Congress and to inform the public on civil rights issues. We have eight commissioners serving six year staggered terms. Half are appointed by whoever is president at the time and the other half by Congress. So as it's set up, uh, it is meant to be a bipartisan commission. So Broken Promises updates and expands upon the commission's 2003 Quiet Crisis Report which highlighted disproportionately lower federal funding for Native American programs compared to other populations. 
and found that the lack of sufficient funding was perpetuating a civil rights crisis for Native Americans. In 2014, the National Congress of American Indians organized a meeting of tribal leaders for me, and they urged me to update our 2003 report because it had been so critical in their work in educating Congress and the administration. I proposed a hearing which the commissioners agreed to do in 2015 after a bipartisan group of members of Congress also asked the commission to not only update the report, but also examine the state of infrastructure in Indian country. We held a briefing in Washington, D.C. in 2016, where we heard from tribal leaders and federal officials and other experts. Our staff also conducted a massive amount of budget and program research, and commissioners made various trips to Indian country. Representative J Derek Kilmer of Washington invited us to a listening session at the Quinault Reservation with tribes from across the Pacific Northwest. A group of commissioners also went to Standing Rock, and Chair Catherine Lehman and I also attended our South Dakota State Advisory Committee series of briefings uh, and heard from the Avala Sioux tribe. Um, I'd like to note that it, our report discusses the alarmingly low social health and economic indicators observed in Native American communities compared to non-Native communities and the harmful effects of chronic underfunding and sometimes inefficient structure of existing Native American programs. The report is broken into five chapters where we examine Native American programs, criminal justice in public safety, healthcare, education, and housing, and a new chapter on economic development that was not discussed in 2003. In each chapter, we look at the areas through the lens of whether the federal government was meeting its trust obligations, whether the tribal governments were being treated as distinct sovereigns with special government to government relationships with the United States, and whether federal programs promoted tribal self-determination and self-sufficiency. I'll now highlight some of the report major findings and recommendations. As we found in 2003, the U.S. government was continuing to fail to provide and fund sufficiently Native American programs that meet basic needs. The lack of investment in infrastructure and housing, education, health, and economic development is undermining the ability of many tribes to self-govern and is violating our nation's trust responsibilities. Native Americans are not being given equal opportunities to raise their living conditions to the standards enjoyed by other Americans. Here on this slide, I've given some examples of underfunding, such as Department of Justice and the Bureau of Indian Affairs Public Safety Initiatives that I'll talk about later, numerous Indian Health Services and BI, uh, Bureau of Indian Education programs, and housing programs funded by HUD. For most programs, we found that funding was flat or had actually decreased since our 2003 report. For the few programs where funding has increased, that funding generally did not keep pace with inflation. Moreover, even when there were increases, the funding failed to meet the federal government's trust obligations to Native Americans. And the end result is that still today, Native Americans as a whole experience dramatically lower quality of life across every dimension the commission evaluated as compared with non-Native Americans. The commission also found that federal and state governments often treated tribal nations differently from state and local governments and often did not fully recognize their sovereign status. This unequal treatment also results in very harmful outcomes. For example, the Commission found that Indian Health Services budgets did not receive advanced appropriations, while other federal health care programs, such as those for the Veterans Administration, do. This makes it very difficult for Indian Health Services and tribal health care providers to engage in long-term planning and budgeting. This has been particularly a problem given the uh, constant problem Congress has recently had in trying to pass timely budgets. Uh, and therefore further delaying disbursement of funds and planning. One area I'd like to particularly mention is the effect of insufficient funding for the criminal justice and public safety programs in Indian country. 
The federal government has a trust responsibility to provide for the public safety, but is failing to do so. The lack of investment and support of basic needs, education, economic development, and law enforcement infrastructure has resulted in Native Americans as a group suffering one of the nation's highest rates of crime victimization. For example, Department of Justice crime statistics show that Native Americans are victims of violent crimes at a rate of two times the national average. Native American women are 10 times more likely to be murdered and four times more likely to be sexual, sexually assaulted than the national average. In fact, statistics indicate that one in three Native American will be raped in their lifetimes. Although we found that funding for these programs has increased, tribal law enforcement, detention centers, and courts are all still woefully underfunded, leaving tribal governments unable to provide adequately for the safety of their communities and also to protect their natural resources. Another example in this area is the implementation of the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010. While this legislation was a positive step in providing tribal governments with new authority to prosecute certain crimes in Indian country, we found Congress has not appropriated sufficient funding for most tribes to actually implement the authority. For example, the act required tribal governments wishing to have this expanded authority to implement due process protections and provide defense attorneys to indigent defendants. But this takes resources and training to fully implement and sustain. Moreover, President Trump's FY 2019 budget proposed to end funding for the Tiawahe Initiative, a program that has succeeded in reducing violent crime by 56% over three years in four Native American communities. Those kinds of programs show that when there's investment, they are successful. The commission made several recommendations calling on the nation to fulfill its treaty obligations. And one of our first major recommendations addresses the congressional request asking us to investigate the state of infrastructure. Our investigation shows that the right kinds of investments can promote social and economic well-being. Our South Dakota State Advisory Committee hearing presented many promising initiatives by Native American entrepreneurs bearing fruit when programs work as they should. The commission recommended that Congress make a major investment in unmet essential utilities and core infrastructure projects, such as electricity, water, telecommunications, and roads in Native American communities because basic infrastructure is critical to being able to improve health, education, and economic conditions on tribal land. Indian country needs a major investment to catch up from the decades of neglect. Currently, some legislators are considering a major infrastructure bill for the United States to support long overdue maintenance of roads and bridges and other construction. This is an opportunity to look at investing in the basic infrastructure on reservations. Such investments would yield dividends in improving the health and economic viability of tribal land. The commission also examined how money is distributed to tribal governments, and we recommended that federal government provide steady, equitable, and importantly, non-discretionary funding to tribal nations. As I mentioned before, this would have a positive impact in long-term planning for tribal governments and would protect their funding from cuts due to sequestration, which has had a devastating impact on Native American programs when they have often occurred. We found that this provides a type of funding that will promote tribal sovereignty. One new area that we explored in this report was economic development. We found the federal government has failed to honor its responsibility to promote Native American self-determination via its support of economic development. While many Native Americans are succeeding as teachers and doctors and lawyers, artists, writer, writers, scientists, and entrepreneurs, the poverty rate of Native Americans is approximately twice the national average. In addition, Native Americans experience higher rates of unemployment than any other racial group. The unemployment rate for Native Americans approaches 80% or higher on some reservations, and Native Americans have the second lowest medium household income among all racial groups. And due to the geography of some reservations, some Native Americans might travel far distances to work 
and report facing discrimination outside the reservation when they do. Here in, here in the chart, we show how non-stimulus funding for road maintenance in Indian country has remained flat despite almost $300 million in deferred maintenance costs. When visiting the Quinault Reservation, I learned that there isn't enough federal funding and technical assistance for tribal governments to protect, manage, and develop their natural resources, whether it's agriculture, fisheries, forestry, or other natural resources found on their land. For example, insufficient funding for the BIA branch of Fish, Wildlife, and Recreation has led some tribes to cease their fishery management and science programs. Climate change is also impacting coastal communities who are already experiencing flooding and will need to move their uh, active buildings and towns. We therefore recommend sufficient funding for the relevant Bureau of Indian Affairs, U.S. Devel Department of Agriculture, and Department of Energy programs to address these needs, which include increasing resiliency to address the effects of climate change. We also heard testimony about the barriers and unequal access to capital that tribal governments face. We learned tribal governments are missing out on billions of dollars of capital because they are unable to leverage federal funding. And various federal tax credit programs and bond guarantee programs are not available to tribal governments, as they are, in fact, to state and local governments. We therefore recommend consistent non-discretionary funding to tribal governments and making these programs more available. In December 2016, commissioners and staff also visited Standing Rock during the ongoing uh, protests against the Keystone XL pipeline after the commission raised serious concerns with civil rights and environmental justice concerns around the pipeline. In our report, the commission urged the federal government to provide more consistent, transparent, and deferential consultation with tribal governments. The federal government needs to strive to reach mutually agreed upon solutions when working with tribes on infrastructure planning and the use and development of natural resource that occurs on or affects tribal lands and communities. Finally, I note that a report includes several recommendations on Native Hawaiians who face challenges similar to American Indians and Native Alaskans, such as overrepresentation in our criminal justice system, disparities in educational opportunities and health outcomes, and poor housing conditions. While Native Hawaiians have persevered to maintain their culture and identity, they still lack federal recognition, which is limiting their full access to some needed and deserved programs and services, as well as limits their ability to self-govern. That's why our report makes a recommendation supporting federal recognition of Native Hawaiians. This is significant because it reverses an erroneous position of the commission that had taken over 10 years ago, which undermined legislative efforts towards providing such recognition. Support for Native Hawaiian sovereignty was one of the first issues I worked on 25 years ago when I first came to Washington, D.C. to work with the Japanese American Citizens League, and the late Senator Kaka was fighting for recognition. I'd like to recognize and applaud the ABA's longstanding work in support of Native Hawaiian so sovereignty. In fact, we noted the ABA's position on this issue as we were uh, considering and debating reversing the commission's error. It has been 25 years since Congress apologized for the illegal overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii. The state of Hawaii recognizes them as indigenous peoples, and under the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, they have a right to self-determination, which our report finally recognizes. These reports were not waived when Hawaii became a state. The Department of Interior has created a process, and at the appropriate time, we believe Congress should act accordingly. The lack of formal recognition belies the trust relationship that has been longstanding and recognized by Congress. I'm pleased that the Commission has finally corrected its position and is standing on the right side of history. Uh, the report was widely covered across the country, and when the government shutdown happened, a report was in fact cited for how the shutdown was affecting already underfunded programs. The Commission also released its report at an 
most auspicious moment in our nation's history with two new Native American women members of Congress being elected, Representatives Deb Holland and Sharice David. Then Representative-elect Holland called into our nationwide call with the Native American community when we were releasing our report, and cited our report in an op-ed where she called on Congress to pass a spending package that meets the critical unmet needs in Indian country. Moreover, our report mentioned the tragic issue of missing and murdered indigenous women, which is due in part to the underfunding of public safety programs in Indian country and the lack of sufficient respect for sovereignty and the lack of working out uh, jurisdiction that will help ensure that criminals get caught and are punished. Earlier this year, Congress took the historic step of holding its first ever hearing on this topic, which is a priority for Representative Holland. While the focus of a report on the trust relationship and the many unmet needs of and hardships faced by many Native Americans, I feel it's important to note that some are thriving and that the Native American community has and continues to make valuable contributions to the United States. The report recognizes that the history is one of resilience and enduring centuries of discrimination, injustice, and broken promises that unfortunately continue to this day. That as the first peoples of our nation, they have joined with fellow Americans to build the United States and defend it in time of war. We hope this report helps to provide guidance to the federal government and other stakeholders to make meaningful progress to meet the federal government's special obligation to Native Americans that it historically has failed to do for far too long. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to the moderator. Elliot, you might be on mute. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just wanted to extend my thanks to you, Commissioner Narasaki, and to all of the other commissioners for all of their excellent work um, on the report. And with that, I will turn it over to Chief Malerbo. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Um, thank you, Commissioner Narasaki, for your comments and for the work that you've done. It's really important to us. Uh, we know how difficult some of these uh, commissions can be in completing the work and we think that your work has been valuable and we will be able to use it to advocate for Indian country. My comments are going to focus mostly on American Indians and Alaska Natives, uh, but I appreciate the fact that you've included Native Hawaiians in this report because they are an underserved and underrecognized population, so we appreciate that. Um, so I start my slides by sharing um, again some key points and major findings because I think that they deserve to be reiterated one more time. Um, we have long known about the deplorable conditions that our first peoples face. The findings of the Broken Promises report are markedly and distressingly similar to the now 16-year-old Quiet Crisis report which resulted after years of advocacy from tribal nations and organizations seeking an update to that 2003 report. This report confirms what we already know in Indian country, that with some minor exceptions, the United States continue to neglect to meet its most basic obligations to tribal nations. These chronic failures have persisted throughout changes in administration and Congress. It is time that both legislative and executive branches confront and correct these. We cannot continue to study this issue, action is needed. This is a humanitarian crisis within our own United States and cannot be allowed to continue. The United South and Eastern tribes, the Tribal Interior Budget Council and others across Indian country are calling for congressional oversight hearings to amplify the findings of the Broken Promises report and hold the executive branch accountable for continuing failure, failures. The commission found that the funding and trust treaty obligations remains grossly inadequate and a barely perceptible and decreasing percentage of agency budgets. In fact, Indian country appropriations of $0.02 trillion contrasts with the $20 trillion plus of United States federal lands net worth, including wealth generated from those natural resources on those lands. Inadequate Indian country funding needs to be viewed as an unfulfilled trust and treaty obligation. 
the funding is not delivered on the basis of poverty or for social welfare purposes. The federal government's trust obligations are the result of millions of acres of land and extensive resources ceded to the United States in exchange for what it is legally and morally obligated to provide benefits and services in perpetuity. At no point in our history has our government fully delivered on these obligations. Much of the federal funding across Indian country is delivered through a competitive grant process and often through states. Not only is this an abrogation of the federal trust responsibility to force tribal nations to compete for federal dollars, the competitive grant process often precludes tribal nations from having access to those dollars at all. Grant funding fails to reflect the unique nature of the federal trust obligations and tribal sovereignty by treating tribal nations and nonprofits rather than governments. ISDIA contracting and compacting should be available options across the federal system. The vast majority of funding for Indian programs appears on the discretionary side of the budget. Because of this, funding for Indian programs consistently falls victim to partisan battles and continues to be impacted by the pursuit of deficit reduction. At less than 1% of federal discretionary spending and an even smaller percentage of total spending, Indian programs are not driving the deficit. In the short term, all Indian federal funding should be protected from shutdowns and continuing resolutions through advance appropriations legislation. In the longer term, federal funding for Indian country must be made mandatory rather than discretionary. Federal funding and services provided to Indian country are the result of trust and treaty obligations, which are not discretionary. So again, once again, I say trust and treaty obligations are not discretionary. USAT SPF, United South and Eastern Tribe Sovereignty Protection Fund, continues to be deeply troubled by suggestions from the administration that federal funding and accommodations for tribal nations and their citizens are race-based and therefore unconstitutional. All federal Indian programs are based on a political government-to-government -government relationship between the United States and tribal nations. It is time to modernize the relationship between tribes and the United States government, given the fact that the assumptions from the 19th century were that Indian people would, were incompetent to handle their own affairs and that Indian tribes were anachronistic and would disappear. The Constitution, treaties, laws, and canons of construction recognize the role of the United States government in upholding the trust and treaty obligations that they agreed to during the formulation of this United States. True consultation requires a seat at the table at the highest levels within administration and in each special advisory committee developed. Only then can a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship be effective at achieving parity equity and justice for American Indians and Alaska Natives. So I say that it is time for a bold approach. With a renewed focus on domestic issues and putting America first, this focus must also include a commitment to rebuilding the sovereign tribal nations that exist within the domestic borders of the United States. Much like the U.S. investment in rebuilding European nations following World War II via the Marshall Plan, the legislative and executive branches should commit to the same level of responsibility to assist in the rebuilding of our tribal nations. Our current circumstances are in large part directly attributable to the shameful acts and policies of the United States. One way to immediately begin to deliver upon the recommendations of the Broken Promises Report is for the administration to propose and Congress to demand budgets reflecting full funding for federal Indian agencies and programs. This would provide a full accounting of the federal government's unfunded obligations to Indian country. Articulating the true level of unfunded obligations will allow the administration and Congress to understand where they are falling short in executing the federal trust responsibility and assist in the development of policy to provide full funding. In 2013, as you can see here, there was a review done by the Department of the Interior Secretarial Commission on Indian Trust Administration and Reform. And you can see here that each agency was charged to place Indian interests before those of the agency and of outside parties. And it talks about the fact that all federal agencies, not just the Bureau of Indian Affairs and not just Indian Health Services, has a trust responsibility to Indians. And we would argue that all federal agencies must be providing mandatory funding 
through compacts and contracts to Indian country, should that be the way the tribes wish to receive that funding? And lastly, you know, I think we need to look at how um, we have interagency collaboration. When we think about the Office of Management and Budget, the Office of Management and Budget asserts that over $20 billion in federal funding is appropriated to Indian country annually. From the perspective of tribal advocates, including those who serve on budget formulation committees for federal agencies, the number seems widely inflated with far less actually reaching tribal nations and tribal citizens. We suspect that OMB arrives at this figure by tallying the amount for which tribal nations and entities are eligible, regardless of whether these dollars actually reach Indian country. Both use at SPF and the Tribal Interior Budget Council have asked OMB for a full accounting of federal funding distributed to Indian country. To date, OMB has not responded to that request. You said SBF firmly believes that this information is absolutely essential to the measurement of the federal government's own success in meeting its obligation in the work of Indian nations and tribal nations. So we need to think about how federal funding is consistent with treaty obligations. When we think about rebuilding tribal economies, we need to design policies that provide parity with other governments within these borders. We need to streamline the sources of funding. We need to ensure access to capital, as you just heard from Commissioner Narasaki. Ensure that tax law and regulations promote tribal self-governance. Doing so is going to improve the status of all tribal citizens. Whenever tribes are successful in their economic development, the local and state municipalities benefit as well. And as we all know, this administration is looking at major infrastructure. We need to make sure that anytime there is any legislation passed for infrastructure funding for governments, that the words and tribal nations are included in that legislation. And we also need to make sure that the infrastructure is not coming at the expense of sacred sites and tribal land preservation. The only way to do that is by ensuring that active consultation happens, that tribes are listened to, and that we come to an agreed upon resolution for any consultation and any infrastructure development that occurs. Um, so I appreciate having the time today to share my thoughts. Um, one of the things that I think we need to also continue to recommend is that every agency receive education about the trust and treaty obligations of the United States this needs to occur at the highest levels of each agency. Because as we've seen in the past, there, there are misconceptions about what um, the trust and treaty obligations mean. And there are misconceptions about the, what tribes are actually. Tribes are, are governments just as other governments and we need to make sure that we are treated with parity within our system. So I appreciate the opportunity to provide these comments and Elliot, I will turn it back over to you. Well, thank you so much, Chief Mueller. We really appreciate your comments and all the work thank of you. the uh, you said Sovereignty Protection Fund in this area. Uh, with that, we will turn it over to uh, Chairman Ron Allen uh, for your thoughts and comments on the report. Well, thank you, uh, Elliot. And uh, I want to also thank um, uh, Karen and the Commission um, for working so hard at updating this report from 2003. Um, it is uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, by all of Indian country to um, help the Congress and the administration, administrations um, understand uh, the complexity of our, our very unique uh, government to government relationship uh, as as sovereign nation within the United States government and and, uh, and upholding um, the, the trust and treaty rights. Um, I want to first um, uh, thank Karen. I, I thought that her summary of the report was outstanding. Um, it does capture um, a great deal of the challenges that that uh, that we have uh, categorically across all the different departments and agencies uh, that serve uh, America and subsequently Indian country. Um, and um, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Lynn uh, for her um, remark because her remarks did a great uh, covered a lot of the key points that we've been uh, that tribal leaders have been underscoring now for for um, uh, basically generations. Um, and, and we could probably point to countless testimonies on the Hill, both in the Senate and the House side, um, in our engagement with the, with the various administrations over, over, their, um, over the many, many years. Uh, and um, so I, I really think that uh, it, it, it captures the challenge. Um, Lynn made a couple, couple points I want to underscore. 
um, when we um, um, look at how much resources is available in the federal government to serve Indian country, to try to give Indian country the opportunity uh, that mainstream America has um, um, through all the different programs and, and issues and challenges that we have, from healthcare, education, to housing needs, uh, to uh, employment opportunities, uh, to, to um, stewardship of our natural resources, and, and uh, on down the line of, of the responsibilities of our uh, sovereign governments. And so the report does highlight um, where there are just countless deficiencies. And, um, and I think that one of the things is, is that it's, it's been, it's not just, ever since 2003, we have kept underscoring the, the key points of the, uh, the Commission on Civil Rights reports and observations. And yet, and we do see um, certain movements in different programs where uh, we slowly have been gaining um, success in uh, uh, new resources. And I, I suppose the most recent one is the, uh, the violence against uh, 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 criminal um, uh, actions where we, where we started receiving some money from Department of Justice um, in that particular fund. And that is only recent, um, quite frankly, to try to, to try to tackle the public safety challenges. I guess I want to, um, before I move through some of the other points that I want to underscore, um, the report does a great job of categorically talking about public safety, healthcare, education, uh, natural resources, economic development, et cetera, and, and housing as well. But what it doesn't do is um, it, 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 it recognizes the tribe's sovereignty and our, our unique uh, relationship uh, via treaties or statutory uh, relationships that have been that evolved over the the history of America, but it doesn't note under, doesn't underscore the importance of strengthening the tribal government political and legal infrastructure. Now, often we look to the Bureau of Indian Affairs to play that key role. Um, in you, when you look at the at, at the approximately three billion that, that goes into the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the cover of, uh, many of those those functions of governmental functions, along with other um, responsibilities that it tries to uh, address, um, it's it, it's I, and to serve 573 Indian nations is a, is a huge heavy lift. Um, you look over at IHS and you know, and you see where they currently are in the uh, five six billion dollar range. And, but, but yet we know that the need over there is probably in the range of 36 to 40 um, billion dollars. And so that's just one area of responsibility. So one of the things that uh, I know that we want to underscore with, with the congressional and administrative leadership is that if they want America, American Indians and Alaskan Native tribes uh, and, and Native Hawaiians, I appreciate the shout out for our uh, Native Hawaiian brothers over in, in Hawaii, but in order for them, in order for us to be able to be strong government, to be able to be self-reliant, we have to have strong governments. We have to have strong infrastructure. And so, whether it's the Bureau of Indian Affairs and and or you know the uh, Department of Justice that, that could contribute to to that particular agenda, there is a need to, to strengthen tribal government. So if we're going to be able to um, advance um, these different opportunities that may be made available to us uh, through all these different departments and agencies. Uh, we have to have the capacity to leverage um, funding and, uh, excuse me, leverage financing um, and to have the kinds of assurances Hi, Chairman. This is Elliot Milholland. Just, uh, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Chairman, I apologize, but uh, we, we, we can't hear you right now. Um, hang on. Are you there? Yes.
Hey folks, we, we appear to be having some technical dif difficulties um, uh, with Chairman Allen. Um, perhaps we can um, uh, put a pause while he... Uh... I'm going to try to dial back in. Um, okay, we just heard you there. Oh, right now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Um, I have no idea why it disconnected. Um, uh, <laughs> it's <doesn't> talking. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I, I, I uh, we lost other track on your, on your machine. If you have anything else Pardon open, me? if you have any other programs open on your machine, it may sometimes affect the uh, transmission. Okay. I'm shutting them down. Okay. Uh, um, so, okay, right now. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Ron, we um, lost you when you were in the middle of talking about the need to strengthen tribal governance. So, I, uh, I, uh, I think we're losing you again. The government. Um, Chairman, I think we're losing you again. Uh, perhaps you you may you may want to dial back in. Okay. We should try that. And while we have a few minutes here, um, I'd like to remind everybody um, that you can ask questions. If you look at the right-hand um, uh, uh, corner of your screen, there should be a box with options. Um, that um, uh, and one of the one of the options should be a pull-down menu entitled "Questions." You should be able to uh, type in a question there. Um, we've already had several questions on a, of a technical basis. Um, that um, Paula, our organizer, has answered. Um, um, some of the questions uh, involve whether this uh, webinar is going to be recorded and be made available uh, to the public, and the answer there is yes, it is being recorded. Um, it will be made available. The PowerPoints as well are available right now. Um, there's a, there's a pull-down menu called Handouts, and you can access that, um, uh, access the PowerPoint presentations that were um, uh, presented uh, today in the handout section there. They will also be made available to you um, as a result of your having um, uh, signed up for the webinar as well. So if you have any other questions, please um, uh, please um, uh, in, uh, enter them into the into into that comment box and they will be queued up. And, and once uh, Chairman Allen uh, is able to dial back in and uh, uh, finish his, his remarks, we will turn to uh, uh, to questions from the attendees. So, Chairman Allen, are you uh, have you had a chance to to dial back in yet? I did just did it. Uh, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, uh, please okay. go ahead. Okay. Well, my apologies. Um, I don't know why uh, that happened. But go, uh, going to um, my comment about the um, importance of the uh, the strength and the foundation of tribal governmental infrastructure um, is critical for tribes to be able to advocate for their interests and to be able to utilize um, the different federal resources that are, that are made available to us through all the different departments and agencies. And, um, uh, you know, and, and if we want to be able to become truly self-reliant, without a doubt, um, the, 20, the 20 billion that um, Lynn referenced uh, uh, that serves any country now, and the need being uh, probably well over 200 billion, then that's a huge gap to fill in order for Indian country to be able to become truly self-reliant again and serve all the needs of, our, of all of our uh, citizens and communities. And that infrastructure is critically important. And the, and the challenges of the federal government on how you're helping strengthen tribal uh, uh, constitutions and, and policies and, and tribal codes that, that uh, implement our laws um, that allow us to be able to be um, more uh, self-governing. And that's part of the movement of the self-governance self um, uh, legislation and movement. Now, there's other forums that try to help that, 477, um, et cetera. So they're, they're, uh, uh, they're out there trying to consolidate money. But Lynn made a point that was critically important. If we have resources coming from different departments, the, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Interior, Department of Justice, uh, Department of Labor, Department of HHS, et cetera, then, then we should be able to use those resources through one, one vehicle, one um, uh, legal vehicle in order to modify those, those programs to fit our communities. 
because sometimes America thinks that we're all the same across Indian country. And, uh, and Navajo is not the same as, as the Mohegan tribe. Mohegan tribe is not the same as, as uh, an Athabascan tribe up in Alaska. So we have to be able to fit these resources to fit our communities in order to address the, um, the needs of our communities, whether it's service needs or whether it's, it's oper advancement of economic development to, to be able to, to, be able to, to generate unrestricted revenues and put less of a burden on the federal government. And we're not trying to remove that, that obligation and, and responsibility because of treaty and trust obligations. But, but what we are trying to do is figure out how we can be find new resources that aren't available in the federal government. So we are consciously aware of the, of the huge uh, uh, multi-trillion dollar debt that the United States has and the challenge with regard to discretionary monies um, with, with, within the federal uh, uh, annual two tr four trillion dollar budget, et cetera, and so it's it's always a, it's a heavy lift. It's a, it, we're always getting crunched. We're always getting left off the bench, and and we're always stuck with the oh by the way, what about the Indian programs um, policy? I know I know it's not as cavalier as that, but but quite frankly, this report underscores that that is the policy that has been the policy. So it's great that we have a lot of champions uh, in both the House and the Senate side, but what we don't have is a collective commitment by the United States government. And um, um, so that is, is um, that's, that's one of the challenges. So I, from my perspective, uh, as a uh, officer of NCAI and, and uh, um, a leader along with Lynn with the self-governance movement, is how we can work with this commission report, these commissioners, and the Congress, the congressional um, leadership, and hopefully the, the administrative leadership to, to, to chart a course that will try to bridge that gap or to try to strengthen the tribal governments to be able to deal with, with the issues that we have. So Lynn's, Lynn's uh, observations and, and comments, you know, relative to public safety, relative to transportation and so forth, you know, it goes on down the line. We, many of us have a, a, a enormous natural resource responsibilities, um, much less the stuff that, that people get caught up in because, of, because it's, it's the current crises and opiate is, is, is right out there and up front. Um, but it didn't change, you know, the, the problems that, that are other substance abuse issues and the other dysfunctional challenges that, that it causes in our communities. And, and the remedy to try to, be, to, to, uh, in, to advance a preventive program um, that will actually get at the root of why that we would have those kinds of, of social um, um, ills that, that, that we are struggling with that results in high suicide rates and, and uh, infant mortalities and other, other, other uh, challenges that we, we are experiencing in our communities. And uh, so I, you know, when, when we, See the fact that that Indian country, for the most part, is in remote areas, and then the question is, is how do we bridge that? Well, with with the broadband uh, um, infrastructure and and the fiber optics world that we live in, um, that 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 has changed the marketplace, and there is a clear opportunity, but we can't be last in line for the infrastructure that makes that happen. So it's not just roads. It is telecommunication, and, and, it, and it is the, the, the new marketplace that, that, that uh, the new uh, upcoming generations are becoming very comfortable in. So when we hear about um, proposals of, of a $2 trillion infrastructure initiative, Hi, Chairman. I think you just broke up again. Am I back? Yeah, you're back now. Okay. Well, I, I will stop there. Uh, I think it will help uh, um, because I know people would like to ask questions. And I just, what I wanted to try to do is just compliment um, Lynn's um, um, observations uh, 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 in conjunction with Karen's oversight overview of the report itself. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Chairman. We, um, I guess, well, one of the first questions we have really tees off of what you were just talking about. Uh, this comes from Chairman Andy Joseph, um, and he asks, what are the next steps for the commission, for Congress, for the administration, and for Tribe in using the Broken Promises report? How should we best use that report? Well, one of uh, if I, Go ahead. No, go ahead, Lynn. 
I think that, you know, one of the things that we've been recommending is that we hold hearings um, at Congress with this report and that we start working on um, how this administration and our legislative branch can work together to start to remedy the issues that have been identified in this report and to really talk about how we can look at funding differently. So I just wanted to add that actually uh, the commission staff have been working with some of the members of Congress and are planning to do a briefing actually in May, I believe it's May, that's been scheduled uh, about the report. I think one of the challenges that Indian country faces, generally speaking, is there was a, a survey that was done, a polling that was done, I think over a year ago now, that showed that a shocking number of Americans don't even know that Native American tribes still exist. Mm -hmm. They think they are lost to history and they don't realize that we still have reservations, that tribes still exist, that uh, much less do they understand the government-to-government -government relationship uh, that we have with the tribes. So there is a lot that I think needs to be done uh, with public education about Native Americans to heighten the visibility of the challenges and the opportunities, uh, as the chairman noted, with uh, broadband, there is now opportunities uh, with the internet. There are new jobs and industries being developed, but uh, it doesn't help Indian country if they aren't covered by broadband access, which a lot of the reservations are not. Even I was shocked when I was at the Quinault reservation because it is not even two hours away from Microsoft and they don't have broadband access. Uh, the state does high school tests online, and the kids have to be bused to other schools outside the reservation in order to take the test. That should not be happening uh, in this day and age. That is ridiculous. When I was in South Dakota, I could not even get a cell signal in between the reservation and the airport, which is in the second largest city, uh, until I hit the outskirts of the city. That was over an hour <laughs> without even a cell service, much less uh, broadband. So that is why we think uh, doing something, an investment in infrastructure is really critical. Uh, as the chairman and Lynn noted, uh, you can't have self-sufficiency if you don't have basic plumbing, electricity, and uh, internet these days. You can't certainly can't have a thriving agriculture or any kind of office kind of industry, manufacturing, if you don't have water. So. Uh, we find that these things are just really basic. If we want uh, Native Americans as they want to be able to be self-sufficient, we need to make this investment. Right. Um, I, if I might add, just quickly, did you want to jump in there, Lynn? I, I did just want to say one thing, and I agree with everything that you said, Commissioner Narasaki. Um, and, and, but even in terms of serving your people with health care, you know, you're transporting people as opposed to being able to just remotely access, um, you know, uh, specialists and to remotely access physicians. But I think broadly, though, we need to think about a new era of diplomacy and how we reconfigure the relationship that we have with the United States. And I, as I said in one of my slides, if we have to deal with 20 different agencies, um, think about all of the education that has to happen in all of those agencies. If we have to deal with multiple funding sources, how do we deal with that? So I think we need to really kind of take a step back and take a look at how do we work together to eradicate the issues that we're facing and how do we especially get to the point of full funding? So to be able to articulate the number is really important. And I think that's why I'm advocating that we have a high level person to talk about and to be situated within the Office of Management and Budget because that's where the administration's budget um, begins. And so unless we have somebody who is there, who is looking at what those trust and treaty obligations are, I'm not sure that we ever get there. And so, now I'll so stop. Mike, okay. <laughs> uh, we, we have lots to say about these subjects. Uh, well, I, I, I guess, um, you know, Andy's at the forefront um, on uh, identifying the, the needs of Indian country with healthcare. So I guess the, the question in my mind is, I, I totally agree with Lynn's um, uh, urging of, of America to change its political cultural disposition towards Indian country and all of our, all of our tribes and, and our, our communities. 
um, which, which is a heavy lift. Um, to, it requires a lot of education, requires a big change in, in political disposition about um, people's notions about their, um, their responsibility to our, our communities. But so what could happen, what can happen in the near future? Um, once you, everybody sees, I got, I see the problem, you know, and one of your commissioners, Karen, said, you know, that, well, well we, we get the need and we get the, uh, the observation, but this is just impossible. This can't happen. We don't, we don't have the will. We don't have the resources uh, because of, the, of the, the challenges that America has with this trillion dollar, you know, multi-trillion dollar um, deficit and all that stuff. So the question is, what can, what are positive steps that could happen? So advanced funding. I, I, let me back up. For the purposes of creating stability in Indian country, and that's one of the things we need. So we have experienced for many, many years now consistent instability because of CRs and and because of uh, uh, federal shutdowns and stuff like that. So the advanced funding initiative that is being proposed by Congress can be a very positive first step. Um, the, 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 bit, uh, the beginning of a conversation of, of these Indian programs moving into mandatory is not as heavy of a lift as people think. There, there's, a, there's a pushback about ma and, uh, extending ma additional mandatory funding, but, but just like the contract support costs, they uh, recognize that that is a legal obligation that they have to live up to. So there is a, um, um, an opening for that opportunity. The next one I would point out would be uh, uh, authorization, statutory authorization, authorization for interdepartmental or even intradepartmental um, uh, uh, movement of funds of programs so that we can consolidate. That's what self-governance is about. So you take HHS and all those different programs, they should be able to go through one legal vehicle not multiple legal vehicles and, and, and granting opportunities. Um, so they, they, they create a, a hardship for us. And we have the same experience with the Department of Justice. I, I, I mentioned the victims of crimes monies or, or the uh, other uh, the cops monies that are in DOJ and, uh, and, and domestic violence monies that are over there. They should be coordinating with the BIA programs. And so you need, you need a statutory authority to make that happen. And one other example I would put out is it, it's always been annoying to any country that we have HUD programs for housing, but they, but we, but statutorily, or actually by by language in the appropriation um, uh, bills, you can't use IHS for sanitation. So that's just crazy. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And so you should, they should be complementing each other, not conflicting with each other. Well, um, and can I just say one thing too, and I go back to the original, you know, kind of the original premise in the report, and it, it, the key point was the United States expects all nations to live up to it, their treaty obligations, it should live up to its own. So these were sacred promises that were made to us, and it's really time for us to, whether it's a heavy lift or not, to really get to the point of full funding and to get to the point that the United States believes that it needs to honor its trust and treaty obligations. Um, and I, I think the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is a good place to start. If we can use some of those policies, if we can use some of the tenets of that report, I think we can go a long way to at least now opening the conversation and being able to say where it is that we wanna be. Thank you. The next question, um, this, this is all good conversation. Uh, one of the advantages I think with uh, having the section um, hold this call is, is we have the opportunity to have both tribal leaders uh, as well as um, folks who are uh, involved in the section and may not have um, uh, as, as many opportunities to work with tribes um, uh, uh, as they would like. So one question we have, for example, is, is how can we help advocate for tribes in our state? What would make the most difference? What are the things that uh, attorneys can do who um, are interested in these issues uh, to, to do to advocate um, uh, in their states? Well, uh, Commissioner, I don't know if you wanted to start start off. Uh, well, we did observe when we were uh, doing a lot of the meetings that there were a lot of challenges with the state governments as well as the federal government. Obviously, our report was focused on the federal government. So we didn't get into that. Uh, there is a lot of hostility uh, with between tribes and some of the state and local governments that they uh, are neighbors to. Uh, there are issues around state taxing and the ability of 
of um, tribes to be able to generate their own kind of businesses and funding and what kind of tax structure makes sense with state and locals and uh, the challenges that you have when the state and local governments uh, don't want uh, tribal tribal lands to be able to compete uh, with the local things that are going on. There are things that they could do in terms of addressing the overlapping and gaps in jurisdictions in terms of law enforcement. Uh, there's some great work being done in some states where they are entering into agreements with tribal governments about who will have what jurisdiction to try to clarify that and reinforce that rather than to allow gaps to occur where that leads to the, to uh, criminal investigations not happening uh, because uh, each government is pointing at the other uh, and blaming the other for not following up. So there there is a lot of things that can be done uh, on the state level, and um, I hope that you'll get engaged. Uh, one of the things that I am also working on these days is census uh, and the challenge with making sure that in 2020 we have an accurate count and uh, reservations have the highest undercount uh, in 2010, the rate of undercount uh, of any community. And that has devastating consequences uh, for these tribes because a lot of the programs depend on what the census count is. So one of the things you could be doing is making sure that either your state government or your local government is putting money into get out the count and providing some of those resources to tribal government so that they can encourage members of the tribes to make sure that they fill out the forms. There are special challenges because often tribes don't have, people who live on tribal lands don't have street addresses and the census only mails to mailboxes and not to PO boxes. So it's a different kind of count. And then of course, there's a lot of distrust uh, with native people and governments because of the failures of government uh, and there's a lot to overcome in order to make sure that everybody gets counted. And that's in everybody's interest. I think one of the other things that we should be thinking about um, if people are, are interested in engaging in Indian country is to con you know, convene a discussion with the tribes in your state and find out what some of the challenges are. And for the attorneys that work with the state and the local governments, if they're you know, kind of working with them on various projects or they're sitting on commissions or boards, to just simply ask the question, as we're considering these issues, do they encroach upon the rights of tribes? Do they hinder the rights of tribes? Are we advancing the tribe's interests? I think if you can ask those questions and you can answer those questions, then policy will be developed in a better way. And I think whenever there are policy issues that are being addressed and being discussed, the tribe should be have a seat at the table. And that would go a long way to helping um, address some of the issues at the state level. So what I'd I would actually add... like to add one more thing is that uh, because of the ignorance of most Americans about Native Americans, one of the things you could do is check in with what your schools are doing in terms of yeah. what's in their curriculum uh, about Native Americans. Uh, there was a survey done that showed a lot of textbooks stopped talking about Native Americans in somewhere around the 1800s. Uh, and so there's not any modern day discussion about uh, these peoples, and that's important too. Right. I, I, I totally agree. Um, I guess what I would add to uh, both Karen and Lynn's comments is <clears throat> that we, we need to start looking where uh, at, uh, at states and tribes where it is working constructively and, and, and to the benefit of both um, governments. Um, in Washington State certainly is a good example where we, we have lots of compacts where we share tax revenue um, to the benefit of Indian communities and it's been a successful and where, where we can show the, all the businesses that have been growing and developing in, in our Indian communities now benefits the state because it in, and the local governments because it increases their, their tax base. But there's other oppor opportunities as well. Now where Medicaid um, is working in states where it's authorized and that they've accepted it, we can show where the benefit is to a healthier set of communities and show how it works, and particularly the expanded uh, Medicaid um, um, program. And, those, and, then, and then how, where if they would support legislation to authorize um, uh, states where authorized tribes 
to, to uh, be uh, participating in the expanded Medicaid where they don't want to accept it, but it doesn't cost the state anything. And so it's a, it's a net benefit um, to the state. And, and so there's those kinds of things that can be out there and can be, can be hopefully very beneficial. Washington State has another example in education where there is a requirement by the educational system to collaborate with the tribes in their area in order to in insert small components of, ed of education to try to correct the myths uh, and misperceptions about tribes. This, this goes to Karen's point about there's lots of ignorance. So, so we might not be able to change the minds of, of the older generation, but we might have a better opportunity to enlighten um, and, and create a, a better disposition or an understanding of Indian country with the upcoming younger generations. I think we should advocate for a national curriculum. Um, and we've talked about that uh, with the Bureau of Indian Education. We should have a national curriculum that's required because this is part of our history and it's not something that is taught. Like, so the next uh, series of questions comes from uh, Bill Micklin. Um, his first uh, statement is, uh, the Alaska tribal governments are in many instances accepted from eligibility for Indian programs and services available to tribes of the lower 48 uh, by statutory exception or omission this inequity injures Alaska tribes and deserves particular attention and remedy. He also um, states, uh, makes some points about broadband, uh, stating that uh, approximately 30% of tribal communities are without plain old television telephone service and broadband deployment is less than 10%. Many tribes, particularly in Alaska and California, are not connected to the electrical grid. Yet insufficient funding is available for broadband development and none is available for electrification. Collaboration between federal energy and telecommunication agencies is non-existent despite the opportunities to co-locate broadband and electrical media over transmission facilities. Without reliable energy and broadband, tribal communities cannot participate in the modern digital economy. And I will stop there. Anybody have a reaction to Is there those? a question? <laughs> well, well I, I, he's right. this is Ron. I, I, um, he's absolutely right. The last point he's making um, is absolutely correct. Um, it, it was a point that I was making earlier that when it comes to um, infrastructure and, um, and enhancing um, the new economy through the broadband um, industry, um, we're last in line because the infrastructure reaches our communities last. Um, we, we're just not a priority. And so um, the commerce or, 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 or uh, FCC, uh, um, they, they, these, any of these entities who have an effect on that infrastructure that can open up those opportunities for tribes to be able to get basic cell service uh, for tele to have telecommunication, which is inclusive of telemedicine opportunities in remote areas and, and lowering the cost of, of health care. So there's, it's not just an economic market opportunity. Um, it, 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 too. it touches, pardon me? It's public safety too and public safety. That's exactly right. You know, if, if there is crime going on um, in remote areas of the reservation and, and, they, and, we, and if, there, if the federal government or even local governments are, are, have a responsibility, they need to know that's going on in a timely manner. And that's all that telecommunication um, infrastructure um, and capacity. So um, there has to be a concerted effort to reach those communities as a new priority. We, we can't be last in line um, because of these ills that, that we're struggling with, that, that Will's referencing, and he comes from Alaska where you're very prevalent when you, when you understand the complexity of, of Alaska in, in terms of how big it is and how, how remote some of those uh, communities are, that it, it's a struggle. And so the United States government has got to step up to help tribes you know, um, have that capacity um, for basic communication and and, um, and the opportunities that go around it. Um, yeah, I would say two things on that. that uh, so the National Association of Counties, NACO, right, their rural caucus, their top priority is, in fact, broadband. So I feel like there's an opportunity there for uh, the tribes to be working with rural county leaders and doing two things. One, pressing Congress on the need uh, to invest in uh, broadband and encourage uh, either through carrot or stick the uh, 
cable companies and telco companies who provide broadband to extend their reach. Uh, right now they aren't because they're saying it's too expensive. Uh, I can't even get uh, I can't even get faster a speed, and I live in the middle of D.C. from Verizon, so you can imagine what it's like in Alaska. Um, I think that one of the other things that tribes can do is start also going after companies and putting some pressure on them uh, because they are uh, one of the pro one of the sources of the solution and also right now part of the problem. The next so I would not just like aim my aim my uh, advocacy at government. I would also aim it at the private sector. Well, this is a related question. So, um, uh, we're, and we're getting a number of questions, which is great. So, thank you all very much for uh, 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 for asking all these questions. Um, uh, so, I'm going to ask kind of two related questions. Um, one is specifically how the U.S. Commission um, uh, intends to, to uh, you know, what actions the commission itself intends to take to raise awareness of the issues in the report uh, with the administration, Congress, and the general population. I think we've touched on some of those themes, but this is a question specific to the commission itself. And then um, another question um, uh, is, has the report been shared with the president um, and with OMB? Um, because the uh, um, uh, some of the budget recommendations for uh, 2021 um, had cuts to programs um, that uh, help some of um, our most vulnerable populations. So. Um, if you could maybe add, uh, uh, answer those one on the one hand is um has you know what, what are the specific plans of the commission itself and then two uh what plans are there to use the report with the administration and with omb so as i noted in my earlier comment we are already working with congress uh, to do some briefings on the hill uh, every member of congress got a copy of the report as did all the major relevant agencies in the white house as they do with all of our reports uh, I think the, there's a political challenge right now uh, with the, this administration in terms of where they're going with their budget. Um, it, in our report, we document the many areas of the budget where, in fact, this administration has been recommending significant cuts uh, rather than expansions in the budget. So there is a challenge there. Uh, the Bureau, uh, the Commission is an is an educational. We don't have any enforcement abilities. Uh, we we have been nicknamed the conscience, uh, the conscience on civil rights for the country, and so we're doing what we can to highlight the need for Americans to have a better understanding about Native Americans uh, and the challenges. Uh, and the you know what the government is doing is in their name, right? So Americans generally need to start raising the issue. If I might jump in, uh, one of the things that tribes have been advocating now for a number of years is to have a um, a tribal representative within the OMB structure at the director level um, so that there's a lot of different Indian programs through all the different departments and agencies. And, and so for somebody to be able to be advocating for those budgets, um, and, and cross over with those different uh, uh, departments and agency budgets as they scrub them uh, from when each department and, and uh, submits their budget. Somebody needs to be there to be our champion. Uh, we do have friends, you know, in each one, and they have a lot on their on their portfolio. But you know, in Indians, is just part of it. And so nobody collaborates and 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 and, and challenges them with regard to why a program over in this agency is very relevant and very important to complement uh, a budget that's in another committee. And so that we, we've never been able to get traction there. Um, and then and I would also say that we, for years, we had a, a tribal representative in the, um, the White House domestic policy to collaborate with OMB regarding the Indian programs and Indian needs. So. So we need um, more champions, and, and we're just asking for an FTE here and there with people who have that skill set, um, who understand how that system works from the White House policy, uh, domestic policy, to the OMB infrastructure. And it's not just a budget process, it's the regulatory side as well. Well, I also think, though, that OMB needs to really quantify how much of the appropriated funds is getting out to Indian country, and that's something that we've been asking for, uh, because so much of that funding either goes through grants or it goes through the states, and it may not get to the tribal communities that it is uh, being appropriated for. 
<laughs> excuse me. So I do think that we need to have an accounting of that. Um, the last time I looked at grants.gov, there's over 2,400 different grants that tribes are eligible for, and I'm sure that that is counted in the appropriations. Well, how many how many tribes could administer that many grants? Yeah, that's actually one of the things that uh, this report uh, is different from 2003, is we actually try to talk about the fact that how the federal government gives money is just as much important as how much money they're exactly. giving. Exactly. Uh, there are a lot of programs like the programs with banks, for example, to encourage lending. They're getting, uh, there's authorization, but the banks aren't actually lending. And we heard a lot in South Dakota about uh, the progress that was being made because you had uh, people who had worked in the federal government and then come back to their tribes. And they understood because they had been in the federal government how the programs were supposed to work. And then, then they worked really hard to hold the banks accountable mm -hmm. because they were trying to get loans that they should have been getting. And then they started looking into, in South Dakota, where a lot of banks are chartered because it's very friendly laws for banks, banks were not giving money. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think Lynn is absolutely right. There has to be an accounting for their programs, but are the programs really working? And if they're not, uh, what is not happening that needs to be happening right right well, we have another question asking um how indian child welfare issues are addressed in the report uh we don't go into depth in terms of what the there are a lot of controversial issues that are always being debated around uh child welfare issues so we we were more focused on what the federal obligations were in, t in terms of funding and supporting kids uh, with adequate resources for health and education. Uh, it's kind of a crime in terms of what's happening yeah. in the lack of uh, funding for health care for kids uh, and education. Uh, we've heard testimony across. We, we take up Indian issues not just in this special report, but we've made sure to actually cover Indian issues in all the hearings that we're having. Uh, so that it's not just Indian set aside, but actually seen as the broader part of America. And we heard very sad stories when we were taking up the issue of, of funding of public schools about kids, you know, who are attending schools who didn't even have heat in the winter uh, or didn't have clean water uh, and couldn't access that. And that is obviously going to be challenging in terms of children's health and their ability to develop. Um, another question asks, um, and this is maybe more a tactical question, what are the most realistic legislative goals for Congress in the next year or two on these issues? Advance appropriations. I would agree. I'm actually... Appropriation. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I'm actually uh, optimistic because we have the two new Native American members of Congress. Uh, and as an Asian American, I know how important it is to have someone there in Congress who is from the communities as opposed to just talking about the communities. We have a lot of allies in Congress, which is great on these issues, but there is nothing more personal when you're one Congress person is talking to another to be able to say, I actually am that person. This is my story. And that person knows you personally. Uh, I'm Japanese American and I know that the reason that Japanese Americans were able to get redress and an apology for the internment of people like my parents and my grandparents were because we had Japanese American members of Congress who were who had experienced it and were able to tell other members of Congress their personal story. I know that for a fact because I had to lobby for um, uh, additional payment uh, once it got passed and I so I asked I had to find out well why did your boss who's Republican who normally doesn't vote on these kinds of issues why did they vote and they said well he knew Norm Mineta, uh and he knew him personally and he knew his story and you know the vote was on that so I, I think that this is a new opportunity a new era and it's exciting to see and I'm hoping more Native Americans get elected uh, to Congress and uh, get into OMB and the agencies because uh, 
uh, there's no substitute for having someone who's actually had the li lived experience. Oh, this is Ron. I, I totally agree with Karen's um, observations and and encouragement. The, the two native that uh, uh, congressional leaders on the on the Democratic side complement the two that are on the Republican side of the aisle in the House. Um, we don't have any yet in the Senate, um, but but th these are encouraging um, um, uh, trends, uh, if you will, uh, for uh, both um, people of color and women. Um, women made great strides here in this last election. Um, so th those are all positive uh, developments, and and uh, and I know that uh, in 2020 we'll, we may lose one or two that that are going to retire, that are good friends that we spend a lot of time educating and becoming um, friends or champions for Indian country. That will make a big difference for us. But I, I uh, circling back to to Lynn's comment, first things first, the advanced appropriations. Um, uh, legislation based on our past experience with both CRs and, and, the, and the most recent uh, uh, shutdown effect, um, I think is a good opportunity for us. Um, the uh, removal of language in the appropriation committee, uh, appropriation bills that, that uh, restrict uh, IHS and HUD monies to be uh, used in collaboration for housing projects and initiatives could be one that we could get uh, uh, some, some good strides. And, there, and healthcare is a big one. Um, and what uh, National Indian uh, Health Board and, and uh, Indian Country has been doing with regard to um, identifying with with good metrics um, of um, of what the healthcare needs are, and I think that they measured it in the 36 to plus billion dollar range. So they they proposed a long a long term ten I think it's 10 years um, with with a more um, aggressive increase um, on an annual basis. Those are kinds of lifts that might get traction. Um, we might not get what we are asking, but we might get something more than what the, the trend has been in the last 10 years. Yeah. And then I think we need to work towards mandatory funding and expansion of self-governance. I mean, I think those are the two long-term um, areas that we need to really focus on. I would agree. And I would add, if there is a big infrastructure bill moving, I'm hoping that Native Americans can uh, get a healthy piece of that action. Right, right, right. Because you are exactly right about water. It's shameful that up to 25%, depending on where you live, up to 25% of Native homes do not have running water. Again, how do those communities provide for healthcare and economic development and just basic you know, social needs if you can't even have running water? We have several questions here um, about education and uh, what are the kind of concrete first steps one can take to educate um, both your states um, and provide more education in schools um, about uh, modern uh, uh, aspects of tribal um, govern uh, governance in these issues and um, you know, how to go about rep uh, educating state representatives on these issues. Well, one of the things, uh, that, that's a tough one. Uh, um, working with um, um, the, uh, the National Conference of State Legislators um, Forum um, is one area where tribes, tribal leaders can penetrate um, in their education subcommittees. They have numerous subcommittees uh, in, that, in that forum. They meet on a regular basis and, and they, they, they discuss these kind of subject matters. Uh, I would advocate for what Washington has done. I don't know what some of the other states have done in this matter in terms of getting better collaboration um, with this, but the public school system um, and, and um, tribal history um, and being able to provide uh, specific tribal cultural um, activities, including languages. Um, so, some of our schools are actually providing an opportunity for language for their, for their, uh, their uh, children. And so, and showing how that is quite successful, and how some non-Indians are even interested in it, you know. Um, so it's it's um, it's a great opportunity that is is being um, uh, shared out there. So you you got to it, it, working with legislators can be challenging uh, because they all have many many challenges throughout the, each of the states, um, and their 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 um, their their own financing status is 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 um, volatile as well depending upon how strong their economies are. But uh, I, I would throw that out as, as one of the suggestions uh, and um, 
And tribes spent, have historically <clears throat> spent most of their energy dealing with the federal government. And, and we're, we're really trying to urge tribal leadership to stay more engaged, uh, not necessarily take away from the federal involvement, but to get more engaged with the state legislators and, and their executive branch, uh, which they typically do, the executive branch. But the legislative branch, they, they take their eyes off, it, uh, off of them unless there's a piece of legislation uh, that's emerging in those state capitals that, um, that, that strike tribes' interest um, or, or of concern to their interest. But on the education side, it's, it's very difficult. And then there's one more component to it. That's a public system where most of our kids are in public system. But we have a significant number of, I think it's about 185 or so um, Indian schools, that are BIA schools. And if you went to those schools, um, those schools are very, they're, they're struggling in terms of just infrastructure and, and, uh, and uh, school uh, facility replacements or upgrades or just the, the ratio of teachers to the students so that they get the same quality education that um, the, 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 uh, private, the public sector has as well. Well, and, and I think there's a couple of things too. One, I think we need to make sure that we are providing an orientation to all new state legislators, right? Um, just, and I think we should be doing that at the federal level as well, about what, what the relationship is, what it needs to be, how, you know, how we should interact with one another as governments. I mean, I don't know that that con uh, occurs consistently throughout Indian country, but I think it's important that we do that. And you're right, Ron, I, we always focus on the federal relationship because that is the trust and treaty relationship. It's not with the states, it's with the federal government. Um, but we do need to make sure that we are keeping an eye on what's being you know, proposed in, in the legislature at the state level. And we need to talk about those areas of shared jurisdiction, cross jurisdiction, um, and ways that we can complement one another's work as opposed to um, you know, be oppositional with one another. And in terms of you know, the school systems, I think one of the best ways that we could educate people is one, again, I think we need to advocate for both the national curriculum as well as the state curriculum. But we need to provide funding for Indian people to become educators because regardless of where our tribal children go to school, they need to see people who look like them, who understand them, and who are part of their communities. I imagine, you know, so I went to a school called Mohegan School, and it was, you know, it was a, you know, it was a public school. It wasn't it wasn't our tribal school, and imagine being taught about Columbus at Mohegan School as a Mohegan child, right? It, it makes no sense. So we need to make sure that you know we are telling our stories, and that you know we are not looked at as just historic figures. You know, it's you know you look at Native American History Month. Well, you know we always get asked to speak during Native American History Month. So this year I talked about well, what's new in Indian country as opposed to what's our history, uh, because I, I think we need to make sure that people understand we are still here. You know, we're here and we are part of this this country and we are trying to create vibrant economies for um, to provide for our citizens. Um, the report itself contains um, a dissent. And so I have kind of a two part question about that dissent. First is uh, kind of, uh, how, how common is it that these reports have a dissent? Um, if you could maybe explain what what the role of a dissent is in, 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 in a report like this. And then secondly, um, the report itself um, uh, talks about, or the dissent itself um, talks about, uh, criticizes the United States for putting the interests of tribes ahead of the interests of individual Indians. And states quote that the federal government should be trying to further the interests of individual Native Americans, not tribes. Um, this is uh, the dissent from Commissioner Kersenow. Uh, and he argues that the, um, that the welfare of individuals is more important than the welfare of tribes. So I'd like to get um, kind of the, the response of uh, or the panelists' views on those statements. So I'll take the first one. Uh, so every report, commissioners, all commissioners have an opportunity to do a commissioner's comment. And then they have an opportunity to comment on each other's comments. And then they have a third opportunity under certain circumstances. Um, uh, both of our two most conservative commissioners, uh, Gail Harriet and Peter Kersnow, wrote comments uh, to this report. Uh, Commissioner Harriet uh, is, is vehemently against the notion that Native Hawaiians are a indigenous people, 
uh, and B, deserving of any kind of special relationship with the government. Uh, and so she wrote um, a very lengthy, she'd actually been one of the people testifying at the hearing when the commission took its first really mistaken position. Uh, and then uh, Commissioner Kirstenau wrote a very classic, I think, conservative uh, viewpoint in terms of uh, he basically is against spending government money on anything but defense, uh, and so that kind of shows up in in his positioning. Um, the, normally, um, many of the commissioners would also do a comment. Uh, we decided the progressive commissioners did not in this instance. Uh, partly, we were trying to uh, get the report out as quickly as we could. Uh, and uh, we know that doing those kind of comments delays the, the publication. We had been working on it for four years, and we wanted to make sure that it got out in advance of this Congress. Um, so I will let uh, our other panelists comment on <laughs> their responses to uh, Commissioner Kirstenau's remarks. Uh, well, all right, so his remarks stab, put us just stabbed me right through the heart um, because, you know, his remarks are reminiscent of termination, right? That's the termination era. That's why people got relocated to cities from tribal reservations to, you know, have, you know, to participate in the economy locally and, or, you know, kind of broadly and, and to kind of leave their tribal roots behind. Um, but there is nothing more important to us than our tribe as it exists as a government and as it exists as a community. Um, and we've experienced so much of that sentiment that you know it's really about individual uh, individuality as opposed to the tribe, but we would vehemently oppose his position. We believe that you know we exist because our ancestors held on and it's our job to make sure that our governments thrive and that we are recognized as a government just like any other government is recognized. Um, so I think you know his his comments were short sighted and I believe they were um, they were intentionally not recognizing what the obligations of the United States has to its first peoples. So, I, so my, my thoughts are, <clears throat> um, it's just a reflection of the political realities of our, 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 our nation. And uh, um, you get these variety of views when it comes to indigenous people. Um, you know, talking, going to Karen's first point about the native Hawaiians, I, um, without a doubt, that's very disappointing. Um, Indian country has been very supportive of, of native Hawaiians um, uh, for generations, quite frankly, since they've been trying to restore their, their sovereign status. That, that was, uh, from my perspective, stolen from them um, many years ago. Um, but uh, so, you know, so you have those kinds of issues. I guess when I look at a, a person who has uh, a place of key role, it's no different than somebody in Congress. You know, so a piece of legislation is out there and you're going to have people who are just because of their, their uh, educational knowledge and understanding of indigenous people are going to have a, a very a narrow view of what our rights are, what our unique uh, uh, standing is in America, and forget or try to revise history um, uh, about America. They, m more often than not, don't even know that Indians are in the Constitution, that the Constitution was, was, was developed around Indians and the and way the Indians used to manage our, our mental infrastructure. So we actually had played a part in it, much less the fact that, that they recognized uh, the leadership at, at the at the origins of this country that they that they had to be respectful of these these nations they were nations that they were unique governments and and they were indigenous people that were here before anybody else showed showed up so we're going to always have that educational challenge um and and a narrow perspective out, out there and all we can do is is to be thankful for the karens and those that are that are trying to put the facts and the truth in front of America to um, to take responsibility, you know, for uh, uh, broken promises and for uh, injustices. Um, when we look back in the history, this didn't even touch on all the countless injustices that are still scars on on Indian communities across America, from the eastern seaboard all, all to the western up to Alaska. So um, it's uh, you know it's up to us to keep pushing the envelope and keep putting the, putting the truth out there so that uh, people can, can start to own up to 
what can we do constructively uh, within the reason within the resources we have available yeah and i i think it's important to note that i think commissioner's personnel's uh, position is at the far right extreme uh, the Republican uh, national platform for the last election was actually pretty good, I think, on Native American issues. I think it was actually better than the Democratic platform was in terms of the detail that it went into. And Native Americans have enjoyed bipartisan support in Congress. Uh, they have many Republican allies in both the House and the Senate. And uh, that's what gives me hope, I think, in terms of Congress's ability to turn it around. So I think that's important to note uh, that uh, this is not, uh, from my perspective, the mainstream Republican view on uh, on uh, on what our relationship should be with the Native people. Thank you. Um, so uh, as you might imagine, the questions coming in are uh, bouncing around from topic to topic a little bit. Um, one of the things that um, uh, has been asked is, uh, and some of them are really relate directly to the report, others direct, relate to kind of general issues in Indian country. So I'm trying to focus really on the ones that relate to the report. One question is um, that the USGAO uh, just released a report that uh, examined uh, some of the key uh, factors that inhibit consultation between tribes and federal agencies on infrastructure projects. And I wonder if that's something that was um, addressed in the report uh, or, or those types of issues uh, were addressed in the report. If you could talk a little bit about the um, some of the factors that uh, hinder effective consultation between tribes and uh, and various federal agencies on on uh, big infrastructure projects. I think the report makes note that there are these problems in terms of consultation. Uh, we didn't really get into examining what all the various factors might be in terms of what is inhibiting that. Uh, Part of the challenges, as, as uh, Lynn pointed out, is, uh, you know, in a large federal government, agencies don't even talk to each other uh, mm -hmm. and coordinate, much less do they do well with talking with outside um, interests. So I, I think that's just a challenge that has to be overcome, generally speaking. But I'm glad to hear that the GAO has a report and is really looking at that issue, uh, because I think a lot of the problems are unintentional. And so then hopefully can be solved. It's not ideological. Uh, it's just things that could be cleaned up. And one would hope in an administration that is very focused on uh, trying to uh, limit the regulatory uh, uh, issues uh, to decrease regulation, that one of the things they might be looking at is what is sensible regulations for Indian country, uh, what is working and what is not working. I haven't had a chance to read the report yet, but I think, you know, it's fundamentally, it's one thing to consult. It's another thing to take the information that you hear and then develop a plan that's satisfactory to both parties. And, you know, to me that I think, I think that's what's missing in tribal consultation. Each agency is required to consult with us, but I think each agency has a different definition of what consultation means and what they should be doing with it. Um, so, um, you know, for in some agencies are really good about holding consultation, they understand what it means um, to consult and, and to consult regularly and others believe that if they meet once with the one Indian organization, that's adequate consultation. Um, so it is up to Indian country to make sure that as we think about consultation that we do it in a way that is consistent across the board, um, but that actually has results and has outcomes that are acceptable um, to both parties, and I think that's lacking. Yeah, so I I, uh, I, I agree with uh, both Karen and uh, Lynn's comments uh, about this subject. Um, there's a couple of different GAO reports that are out there, and and I think that they um, comment um, or underscore the observations of the Civil Rights um, um, Broken Promises report. Um, and the consultation is a complicated process. And I agree with Lynn, some agencies know how to do it fairly well, um, and others don't know how to do it at all. They just, they just are a fish out of water um, when it comes to uh, how, how am I supposed to carry out this responsibility that was articulated or established by either the president or subsequently the secretary of the department. So 
um, it's it's an ongoing challenge. Um, and I remember when, um, President Obama came on board and demanded every department and agency to have a policy. And we got overwhelmed, quite frankly, by all these different policies that, that come from every direction, uh, even the even the, uh, uh, the the military from all, all the militaries. Um, and so th that is a that is a huge challenge for us. But but one of the things is the consultation is critical for departments to be able to get an understanding why are they, why are they uh, uh, not living to their, their obligations, their trust, their trust obligations to Indian country. And, to, and, and if they were going to prioritize, are they engaging it? So that is, that is uh, critically important for, the, for that to happen. So I, I, um, it's, and then the, there's another report that came out about agencies at risk, uh, IHS and BIA, and, and I think HUD was on that list. And there are agencies that, that are really not living up to their responsibilities and they're, and they're, and they're, they're, they're federal or, or trust responsibilities. And so the question is, what are they going to do about it? You know, so will they have the integrity to own up to, yes, we've made some mistakes here and there. And so, okay, we did. What are we going to do about it? And so looking for the agencies that, that are identified in the in that you know, GAO, GAO report um, is going to be part of the solution. Um, so this this report, this the, um, the civil rights report, um, has so many components to it, and it's a matter of how we can try to keep track of them, and then how we can measure are we making any kind of progress. And it's probably something we didn't do as a result of the 2003 report that to track it and keep measuring back. Uh, are we making are we making any kind of headway anywhere on any of these subject matters? And that would be one of the things that I think we should keep a close eye on this one that's updated now. And can we use it as a as a me measure um, um, I I instrument to determine whether or not we're we're making um, progress on any, on any of these areas that they've shown the light on? Yeah, I, I think one one practical approach and. I know for um, the Asian American community, we've been really working on this for the last two decades is, uh, again, nothing substitutes for having someone who has the lived experience and really trying to recruit more Native Americans to serve in the federal government, to actually be in the government, uh, and be able to, A, you know, flag where there are things that are going to touch upon Indian country in ways that someone who's not expert is not going to understand and be uh, where the consultation in some ways becomes less important because you have someone in there who actually already understands uh, and is acting on that knowledge. So um, one of the, the big successes for the Asian American community was to get the White House initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders, uh, an executive order that required the creation of a commission but more importantly to me than the commission was actually an order that uh, required the creation of representatives from the various agencies to be on an interagency task force and to come up with plans about how they were going to better serve the Asian American community. When I first came to Washington 25 years ago, people didn't, we were invisible totally uh, like Native Americans. Uh, I would show up and uh, people would say, I'd say, I'm here to talk about civil rights for Asian Americans, and they'd say, and what would those be, and who is an Asian American? <laughs> uh, so uh, I know, or I, I feel it personally, which is why I have uh, been an advocate on Native American issues. I think there's a lot of ways that this could be made more visible, um, but trying to come up with maybe handbooks on what uh, what successful consultations look like, uh, and trying to get uh, that in front of agencies might be helpful. So, uh, uh, yes. Ron, I, so can I ask a question myself? Uh, um, the, in the report, you reference um, urban Indians, and and uh, um, and the point that you know that, that somewhere in the neighborhood of seventy percent of Indians are in urban centers, um, uh, or or large or smaller cities, et cetera. So. One of the things I think is that we, have, we as we talk about government to government relationship and, and that respectful relationship with all these uh, Indian communities throughout America, 
we have to figure out a way to make sure that we don't lose sight of our citizens and our, our community members who live in those urban centers, those urban areas. They get health care, they get Head Start programs and, and so forth. And it, it is a little bit of an afterthought policy. And, and Karen, so I don't know, if, uh, I didn't read it closely about that, but it caught my eye that at least you recognize um, there, there's some serious deficiencies in serving uh, indigenous people in those kinds of forums. Yeah, we weren't able to really get into that because a lot of the federal programs are really targeting towards the tribes and towards reservations uh, and not generally to Native Americans. But I do agree with you that that is an issue that really requires more focus. What is happening uh, uh, in terms of adequate services for those who are not living on reservations? Because we know, I mean, we know that there's lots of discrimination. We know that there is high poverty outside of the reservations as well, and all all of that needs to be looked into. Well, finally, we have a question about kind of next steps again, um, uh, and I believe that uh, some of the original ashes were focused on advanced appropriations in terms of next steps in Congress. Um, I have a, a comment from uh, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Andy Joseph Jr. Uh, who also stresses that um, there needs to be a bill that follows the IHS National Tribal Budget Formulation Workgroup budget request to phase in full funding over the next 12 years for IHS funding and to include uh, programs authorized under the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act that are not yet funded and that we need mandatory spending and um, to for the Department of Health and Human Services to authorize all of their programs to be uh, 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 contractable or compactable under um, the Indian Self-Determination Act. Um, so I don't know if uh, folks want to uh, respond to that as well in terms of uh, kind of uh, uh, ongoing goals for funding uh, and and to reach some of the funding levels that are recommended in, in, in this uh, in the Commission's report. I mean, so I would just say yes to all of them. Uh, you know, they're all goals that we need to be working on. Um, but again, I think one of the things we need to do is kind of break down the silos of funding within health and human services. I think that's really important um, because in health and human services, there are 554 different grant vehicles that tribes cannot participate in. Um, I mean, you can, um, but it's, it's almost impossible. And that really is not the trust and treaty obligation uh, vehicle for funding. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that we need to think about with health and human services is to go back to self-governance and to look at all of those programs that really impact the social determinants of health and to try to um, strengthen our communities by trying to compress that funding into one funding vehicle. So my, my thoughts are, um, uh, from my jump, I, my thoughts are Andy and, and, the, and the tribal leaders who work on, on the IHS budget itself, what its needs are, um, I referenced earlier, I think that they've, they've identified the need of around $36 billion or so annually, and, um, and they try to get a 10-year plan. So for me, next steps um, is for us collectively to make sure that we're all singing off the same song sheet on that that's reasonable, um, that, that you know, an increase of a, of a billion dollars, or, and I think that their request is like two, something like that, um, that, but we, but that we need that and to try to get um, a, a better lift to the annual appropriations uh, to, to try to start bridging that gap. Uh, so I, and, and that, to me, that passes the red face test because um, they, they, they come up with the right metrics categorically. And, and, and to improve the coordination that you mentioned, Lynn, um, HRSA, HRSA resources, there's a lot of HRSA resources out there. And, and I don't think that we leverage them as well as we could or should um, to help solve problems like, like what we're experiencing in the Great Plains area. All those different clinics and hospitals that are out there, um, and it's not just that area, but, that, but that's an area that everybody's aware of. And they, they, all of these resources need to be come to bear to, to, to make that happen. So, but the heavier lift is getting IHS to step up um, and to work better with uh, with uh, Medicare and Medicaid chip programs, so that so that those third party resources are used in a in a um, in an effective way to help bridge the, um, the healthcare gap. Yeah, one of the challenges that our report does try to recognize 
something that Lynn raises, right, with all of these programs is for smaller tribes with less resources, they don't have the infrastructure and staffing to be able to apply, much less to be able to comply with all of the different metrics and reporting obligations. And a lot of these programs overlap and have different reporting <laughs> obligations. Uh, so that makes it even more difficult and more expensive and uh, tribes spend more money trying to, to to administer the federal contract requirements and not the actual services. So I think Lynn is absolutely right in order to really maximize both the accessibility of the programs and the effectiveness in terms of where the money is actually going. Uh, there needs to be more thoughtful look at how do you make sure that the smaller tribes have the infrastructure. I don't know if it's, you know, regional efforts or allowing uh, uh, contacts uh, to make it easier so that you're spending less uh, time and resources on the different administrative costs and efforts and uh, allowing them to spend the money, get the money <laughs> and to spend it more effectively. I think that's a huge challenge. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. We only have a few minutes left, so I'd like to offer each of our panelists to offer any final comments or thoughts they might have uh, today um, before we wrap up. We've got about four minutes left. So my final comment is uh, my term actually ends at the end of November and the vice chair ends uh, shortly after that. We were both appointed by President Obama as independents. So there'll be two openings as well as Commissioner Commissioners Personnel and Harriet, who were appointed by the House and Senate, their terms also end by the end of the year. So conceivably, there are four potential vacancies. And I noted earlier that none of the eight commissioners are Native American or come with a Native American background experience. And so I hope that some of you out there who have the experience, uh, either lived or uh, expertise, might consider trying to get nominated by either the president for one of our two positions or the House or the Senate for Pete or Gail's position, uh, because I think it's important to have that voice on the commission. Uh, and I hope to see that happen when I step off it in November. Well, thank you for all of the work that you did to get this report done. I know it was a long time coming. It took four years, and that's a, but it's a lot of work, and it, and this report has um, gravity to it, and so we hope to use it in a way that will help um, us advocate, and and hopefully change kind of the hearts and minds of some of our legislators and the administration to really think about how. Um, the United States can uphold its trust to treaty obligations in a new way. I um, mean, it's time for, you know, what's what has occurred in the past has not worked. It's time for us to really chart a new path forward. And I think we need to be creative in doing that. And I, I, I would just uh, want to say thank you, Karen, and, and uh, the leadership in, in the commission who took the, um, the, the charge of, of uh, uh, Congressman Kilmer and, and others who supported uh, updating this report. Uh, you did a commendable job, and we know that it was not an easy task to take on. So thank you for, for your leadership and your commitment to Indian country and, and your understanding of, of how complex our world is. Um, and I, I, I um, appreciate um, Lynn's uh, recommendations. The, the most important one is the, the bold steps that we need to take. And for me, it, it's a matter of, of just follow up. Um, this, these reports are opportunities for us to to um, reunite, um, identify what's what are the, um, um, the, the achievable steps, um, short term, and and what are the long term uh, um, objectives that will help change uh, the, the the makeup of Indian country in terms of of um, you know addressing the the many needs of, of our um, Indigenous peoples throughout America. And thank Thanks. you, Elliot, for moderating just, uh, today. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And I just want to give one shout out to Jackie Peta Johnson at the National Congress of American Indians because she spent a lot of time trying to educate me and the and my staff and the other commissioners. So uh, without her and the expertise that NCI has, uh, we could not have put out this report. So just want to give that shout out. That's nice. 
Well, thank you totally all agree. very much to our distinguished panelists and also to all of the attendees, uh, to all of your excellent questions. Um, as we mentioned at the outset, this uh, presentation has been recorded. Um, the uh, materials and the presentations will be made available to all of the attendees. Um, and uh, uh, if you'd like, uh, please contact the section for uh, any additional information or for the contact information for our uh, panelists today. So with okay. that, I will close and uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you.